And hello, everybody. You're very welcome to a new episode of On Location with Sean and Marco. I'm Sean, and uh, flying solo today. Marco's actually on his way to Europe, getting a head start on uh, our coverage, actually on on uh, European soil for our Info Security Europe in London coverage. And uh, yeah, we're excited to be in London. Excited to have the conversations and. And to hear what's going on in Europe and, and around the world from our friends at Infosecurity Europe. I'm thrilled to have Madeline and Topay on from Forrester. To, uh, we're going to have a chat about predictions and futures. And, of course, I think we might even touch on that uh, two-letter acronym that everybody seems to be talking about. We can't, we can't not talk about that. So uh, thank you both for joining me today. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Very good. And uh, I, I, have, uh, I have analyst envy. I'll start off with that. I, I always thought I'd be an analyst. So I, I uh, cherish the work that you do. And uh, so who knows, maybe someday I'll have the opportunity to do some fun <laughs> stuff. And I also love talking with the uh, Forrester team. You, uh, you all have some, some great insights. And uh, any chance I get to, to speak with the Forrester analysts, I'm, I'm thrilled for that as well. Uh, before we kick into... What's going on at InfoSecurity Europe? More specifically, um, maybe a few words from each of you about what you're what you're up to and what your role is at Forrester, so folks know who we're hearing from. And we'll start with you, Madeline. Yeah. So um, my name is Madeline van der Hout. I'm a senior analyst at Forrester uh, within the cybersecurity and risk team, and specifically, I covered uh, or I cover a couple of domains. So from a global perspective, I'm looking at API security. Um, and from a European perspective, cyber security consulting services, uh, threat landscape uh, together with Tope, um, cybersecurity trends, and how CISOs are actually uh, spending their budget. And if we can find any trends in that as well. And uh, one of the other interesting things that I'm working on is actually security operating model. That's intriguing. <laughs> one of the one of the themes that runs through all of my podcasts is operationalizing cybersecurity. Yes, and it's actually something that will always be be it will always be evolving. So it's a very interesting co coverage area, I would say. Ah, well, hopefully we can touch on that quickly, and who knows, maybe we'll have a deeper deeper conversation on that topic because I'm super intrigued by it and I think there's a lot of opportunity to do some things there. Uh, Tope. Thank you very much. Um, Topo Lufon, also a senior analyst based out of Germany. At Forest, I cover zero trust, money detection and response, digital identity and e-signature. So while I primarily cover the European markets, I also collaborate frequently with global colleagues, especially in the digital trust domains. Perfect. Well, thank you both for that. And uh, let's let's get into it. So InfoSecurity London is uh, 4th through 6th in June. It's just around the corner. And you both have conversation. I think you're joining together on one and then and Topi are on another panel uh, looking at AI. Let, let, let's start with the general view of what you think will be the main themes at this year's conference. And so I'm, I'm curious to know, so you mentioned uh, before we started recording the, the, uh, some predictions you made, and you're going to be looking back at that. That might be a good place to start. So maybe if you can share some of, some of those points, Madeline, that would be great. Of course. Well, what we are expecting to see, because it is something that we see everywhere around the world, obviously, is that info security will also revolve quite a lot around generative AI, but I'm actually hoping that we will travel beyond just generative AI and what kind of sophisticated threats we see emerging from that. Because when we have a look at the most notable breaches that occurred in 2023, a lot still stem from poor hygiene. So I think we also need to remind everyone that we still have to work on the basics. So one of our predictions, first of predictions, is that 90% um, of all data breaches will include a human element still. And that really calls for companies to look 
well, at their, at their workforce, at their employees, how can they really change behavior instead of just working on behavior or awareness? Um, one of the things that I have a lot of conversations around is if you have training systems where you just have to look through a video, uh, you see that people will do that while multitasking and that doesn't really change anything. Um, it doesn't change behavior and that will mean that in the future, the human element within breaches will still be very huge. And it's actually something we can really change. One of our other prediction, predictions uh, actually is that at least three data breaches this year will be publicly blamed on uh, AI generated code. And we're saying at least three, because when we're looking at root causes, um, we are suspecting that if it's due to AI generated code, uh, not every company will report that. Interesting. Um... Meaning, and, and I don't know if you have any insight into why they won't report it. Is that they don't want people to know that uh, it was used using they were using generated code or? Yes, unfortunately, or, or, we yeah, unfortunately, we're still working with quite a lot of uh, blaming and shaming when it comes to reporting incidents. So a lot of companies still are afraid. Um, well, that there, there will be repercussions or that there will be actions hold up against that. And um, especially with uh, AI and not having your security elements in place, um, that that could lead to a huge, uh, huge reputational um, damage. And Tope, what are your thoughts on this? I, my thoughts actually mirror Madeleine's. So I think a lot of it is also going to stem from the fact that organizations will try to use AI to generate a lot of code. And beyond just generating code, a lot of the security practices that we've learned the hard way are going to be unlearned because they're using AI to generate code. They're also trying to use AI to validate code. That's going to um, result in a significant number of low-hanging vulnerabilities. And I say low-hanging because if you think about a few years ago where SQL injections were a dime a dozen because a lot of focus was shifted to rolling out code pretty quickly. Right now, we're going, we expect to see similar things with AI because people are going to have a similar approach. It's an exciting tool. It's good for productivity and they will try to automate parts of security that are not yet ready to be automated. Yeah, and I, I can't help but go back to... Um... The, the hygiene and the human element. Uh, if all of our training is for end users to not click on stuff and we're not worrying about don't create code with that, <laughs> we're, we're, we're leaving a big empty gap right there. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really interesting to see those, those, those type of things as well because even when we look at the increase of for instance, software for recruitment um, that are, well, AI is dominating in that field as well, but no one is particularly checking if the people that are applying are real or if the vacancies are actually real. So there could also exist fuzz in the future if we're hiring real people. So there is a lot of elements you can also manipulate in that. Yeah, I've actually heard stories of, and I presume, who, who knows really, but I presume that in, in many of the cases that, uh, that were being referred to, the people were real, but not the people you think they are. So somebody exactly. somebody would do, be doing the interviews, they would, they'd be using, well, somebody who does great at interviews would do the interviews for somebody and then they get hired and, and uh, not be the same person <laughs> that uh, got the job but they're actually the one doing the job. It's quite quite interesting. Exactly. And if we're taking it even further, there is already a woman who trained a large language model based on all the data of her ex-boyfriends and um, placed that in a hologram and already married the hologram. So there are all kinds of interesting, but also disturbing uh, developments when it comes to generative AI.
<laughs> the human the human mind has no no limits i think in that regard to get to get weird um i want to go back to the to the hygiene piece and and maybe maybe touch a bit on on the risk uh areas that you focus on madeline as well um of course i want your uh, your your thoughts on this as well tope but uh one of the things that I've been hearing is, is this concept of resilience and a more of a broader resilience, not just cyber. And I'm curious your perspective on how organizations are looking at the yeah, general hygiene, kind of best practices, follow these frameworks, adhere to these, these regulations. Um, and, and actually then also apply our own our own business <laughs> ethics and morals and goals and, and things like that to the to the policies to really look at it where we need to be resilient how we need to be resilient how we look at risk how we measure it how we mitigate it so any, any thoughts on on that some things you're hearing that, in that regard so I evaluate resilience policies frameworks as in a very boring way. They're basically tools, a way, a means to get to an end. And I like to look at the trades when we're thinking of, of security and safety. So you speak to an electrician, a plumber, or a construction guy. A lot of their safety instructions are there because they know something bad is going to happen. They treat risk as just a part of doing the job. They don't need to have extensive discussions on risk because the outcomes of not following these um of these procedures are pretty binary. And I think we start to learn a lot from that in cybersecurity. We say cybersecurity is meant to enable the business, and this is typically used as you know, providing some sort of leeway to cut corners. But if we cannot articulate why um, the corners should be cut, on the flip side, why a security rule exists, is it because of legacy reasons? Is it because it's just the best practice? On both sides of the coin, it kind of hampers your business case because you're not going to see a construction um, worker arguing about the validity of a helmet. It's pretty binary. It's pretty straightforward. You're going to crack your skull if you don't wear one. And I think we need to be able to create such very binary outcomes um, when approaching risk and security. It's also going to really help our resilience because, again, a lot of safety precautions in the trades are taken with the assumption a system will fail. And that's the whole point of resilience in cybersecurity. There is a tendency for organizations to focus so much on prevention, which is, of course, great. You should try to prevent bad things from happening. The aspect of when something bad happens, how do our systems deal with it? Again, back to the example of a helmet. This helmet has been tested for impact. A lot of organizations have not really tested their um, resilience or response plans. And I think there's a significant gap there. So add to that, there's also something different going on, especially within Europe with NIST 2 and DORA. So we see this le legislation, these regulations coming up and all for the sole purpose to have a more resilient society that the impact of a breach that occurs in our society has a minimal impact. Because if there is a bank who uh, experiences a breach, that can have a huge impact on anyone. We cannot pay our mortgage, we cannot pay our groceries. So huge impact. Um, but what I also hear from companies is that there is so much unclarity on what it means to comply. So a lot of companies are looking at the legislation, trying to find a bare minimal standard just to have that compliance fit. And I think that's actually a disturbing development because it should not be about complying to legislation. It should be about how can I protect my business to a minimum standard at least so we have that hygiene in place and that we can move forward on cybersecurity as a society. I love what you're both are saying, and my my mind's going a mile a minute here. I, I want to, um, yeah, just the whole the whole cost of adhering to regulations, <laughs> right? Uh, this mm -hmm. whole thing. I, I want to go. I want to take the analogy to play of the of the helmet because I think there's something interesting there to dig deeper into. Um, a, a helmet. 
I don't know. We, we, we don't wear helmets in a bus, right? But then the bus has, has safety measures that they test, right? And we don't, we don't uh, rely on just the bus safety measures uh, when we build the roads. The roads have been designed with angles and, and not too tight of turns and, and things like that to, to ensure that vehicles can travel on them safely. If, if we have potholes, we fix them and we put lights to help, help cross traffic and things like that. So how, how do we, in, in the broader ecosystem of, of business operations, where technology is coming into play, workflows are, are, are moving data around and, and connecting businesses and people together. How do we, how do we get to that test? And uh, I'm, I'm hoping you'll tie it somehow to zero trust because I think there's, there's probably some, some hook into that. How do we get the helmet and the safety tests throughout the business? Um, so, if I'm trying to try tie to zero trust, it's going to be a bit of a reach, quite frankly, because while <laughs> yes, they're both um, risk control mechanisms, they are functionally different risk control mechanisms. Okay. However, the principle I'm um, right there. So um, think of, again, any other non-digital system. For example, cars. Cars are designed with the assumption that there might be a crash. As such, there are things like crumple zones, right? There are also seat belts in place. All of this is built with the explicit um, objective of ensuring the uh, passenger and driver survive, right? That's the whole point of the safety mechanisms. Now, when organizations should look at the business, at whatever they're trying to secure, I think it's very important to ask that very basic question, and which is why I say cybersecurity should be boring. What are we trying to secure? If zero trust is the way to secure it, then you adopt zero trust. Now, when we think of zero trust, least privilege, um, uh, consistent monitoring and untrusted by default, right? Those three principles are important, but a lot of organizations don't really understand why. So zero trust becomes another compliant, compliance project that they will inevitably fail at. Now, if you're doing zero trust for um, an environment, now let's think of something, you're a fintech, right? And you have a lot of developers. What you're trying to use zero trust there, first and foremost, should be your development pipeline. Because if you use zero trust everywhere else, but your development pipeline is not secure, why are we really doing zero trust seeing as you're a fintech and development is a huge part of what you do? And that's why I, I like to approach um, security from a very, from a non-digital perspective, because safety systems in the physical world are designed with specific objectives in mind and not just compliance reasons. And, and Madeline, the, the, you mentioned the human element earlier, and I'm, I'm connecting this to Tope's talk, talking about, um, I'm thinking about somebody working in the field, uh, oil field, let's say, um, it, the, the risk or the impact is binary, right? If I don't work this, this uh, valve properly, it's going to blow up in my face and it's going to hurt. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. We have that same, that same sense of, I don't know if we call it fear or reality or understanding of the impact of our digital systems. And Marco and I talk about it quite often where, because you can't, because you can't see it, it's often, it's often magic and it just works. And therefore you don't really understand uh, the impact it has behind the scenes or, or broader. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on this? Well, also when we look at the human element in cybersecurity. So if you have your entire company, you're as strong, your security your human element is as strong as your least experienced uh, employee. And then we're not even talking about different generations and how different generations are um, looking at personal data, for instance. So my perception of personal data uh, is different uh, than, for instance, for my little niece. Uh, she would accept cookies right away. Uh, uh, she doesn't perceive some information as personal information where I would say it's personal information. So I think that's a struggle that companies should address as well. So what do we mean by, by da da sensitive data? Um, have behavior training instead of just videos. 
because social engineering uh, attacks are also focusing nowadays not only on the CTO, but also his strategic advisor, his assistant, because those people also see the same information, but are usually more accessible. Yeah, it's, a, it's super interesting. And I don't know, in your views of, of operating models, um, I think, I think when I think of it, I'm, I'm thinking specifically security programs, but do you bring, do you bring that view broader to operating security within the business as well? Yeah. So one of the things we advise is for CISOs to align their security strategies and their security goals to their company goals. So the context of your company and the environment your company is working on, uh, working in is one of the most uh, important parameters because based on that and based on your company goals and aligning your security to those goals um, you create more importance to your security strategy as well uh, we see a tremendous uplift in CISOs who are directly reporting to the board so we also see that there's we've we've managed security up to the board which is really great it means that there are more budgets um, and that there, that the awareness part of it all is progressing. So you also see that companies are looking at what are the type of things we want to have in house. What can we outsource? And how do we have? Well, how can we work together with all the other departments so we can do it in a secure way? So that actually is a is a, is a great trend that is developing. And do you, do you feel that's a trend uh, globally or do you see the European business uh, having, having a little more maturity in that area? Well, actually, if we're comparing numbers, America is, um, is ahead compared to Europe. Uh, so there, within Europe, less CISOs are reporting into the board than if you compare it with companies in America. I do believe that it is going to change because within the NIST two legislation, they are driving boardroom accountability, and there are huge fines, um, and they can even uh, make a C level resume or or um, a step out of his or her job if they didn't have their security posture in order. So I think that is going to create also a different importance of security when uh, NIST2 is implemented in all European countries. Right. I yeah, we'll have to follow that closely. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Why? Well, you, you both cover so much. And I mean, we're barely, barely scratching the surface <laughs> on the topics. We're kind of, we're kind of touching on little things here and there. And I really appreciate that. I want to, in, in the few minutes we have left, because this is part of our on location. The, the goal is to, to get people to come and chat with you in, in London during the security London. And you both have panels. Uh, so, uh, Madeline, I'm going to give you the, uh, the, the mic to talk about the panel you're on with, uh, with Tope and, and your colleague, Paul McKay. That's on uh, it's Wednesday the 5th at 10 a.m. local time there in London. The title is Navigating Europe's Evolving Threat Ecosystem 2024 and Beyond. Uh, what can people expect to hear from the three of you then? Well, everyone should come to this panel, first of all. Of course. Uh, because <laughs> we're together with uh, Paul McKay, uh, Paul McKay now is a research director at Forrester, but he used to be an analyst as well, uh, covering all types of areas within cybersecurity. Also very not knowledgeable. He has worked on multiple reports on predictions. So he will have also very valuable insights in how we look at predictions and how we determine if they're actually coming true. Um, but together with Tope, Paul, and myself, we're going over what we see in the market. We're going to debate how th trends are evolving, and we're going to have a closer look at the predictions we make. Um, and we're there as well to answer any question anyone has. 
So it's more of an invitation to come and join and, and to have a, a lively discussion with us. Discussions are good. Discussions are good. Conversations make, uh, make things exactly. happen. Yep. Perfect. And, uh, and Tope, your session is waiting through AI overload. There we go. We're, we're all in on AI in this one. Uh, where are we going? What are we doing? You and uh, Stephanie Atimi and Henry Azure, you're going to have a great conversation on this, uh, looking at a number of things. Tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're talking about there. Thank you. So um, the summary version is we're going to be cutting through the fluff. AI has been a buzzword. Well, not a buzzword anymore. There are practical applications these days, but there's been a lot of noise about what it can be used for. And of course, there are a lot of false promises, a lot of theoreticality and deception from vendors. So what this session is going to do is help you cut through that noise, talk about practical deployments of AI and how you can start getting value from it today. Um, whatever biz potential business initiatives you could drive with it. And we're also going to look at some successful case studies. So a lot of this is bringing it down to earth, filtering um, the noise and focusing on how you can get tangible benefits from AI because we run the risk of AI just being this thing that people slap on pretty much everything else. Think of how companies randomly added .com to their names, even though they had nothing mm -hmm. to do with the internet. We've gotten to that point with AI. So we need to figure out how we get actual benefits and that's what this session is gonna help you do. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see how many. I was, I was just in San Francisco, and the the, the plus AI on on the names of companies <laughs> was, <laughs> and, and products was uh, it was overwhelming. I'll just say that. And uh, you had me at case studies. Uh, anytime I can get a use case and and hear about how somebody did something, uh, I'm always always very interested in that. So I'm excited to hear what uh, some of those use cases and case studies are of successful adoption. And um, yeah, I want to thank you both. This is, this is supposed to be just a quick chat and, and to uh, meet and introduce you to our audience and, and invite everybody to join us at InfoSecurity London and, and uh, certainly attend these two sessions, these two panels. Uh, they, they intrigued Marco and I, hence the, uh, the outreach to Tope and Madeline to have them on the show. So thank you both for spending a few moments with me today. Wish you a safe journey to London and uh, excited to meet you in person and to to enjoy the conversation, be part of the conversation, take action from the conversation. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode. We uh, will see you on location in London very soon. Until then, keep well, everybody.